people feel a sense of, of stigma or shame. People do not like the sense of kind of finality and admission of financial failure. I've seen studies where people have gone without food purchases, they've let their health suffer, they've gone to extraordinary lengths to try to make sacrifices in order to keep paying the bills for as long as they could before they filed for bankruptcy. That was Dr Joseph Spooner, an associate professor in the LSE Law School, highlighting the emotional toll debt can place on a person and the length some will go to before having to concede they can't pay what they owe. Now, if we were all, you know, economically rational robots, nobody would do that, right? They would say there's a bankruptcy law that exists, the first sign of trouble, I'll just file for bankruptcy. Why should I make these sacrifices? But that tends to be not the way that people actually act. From individuals to governments, borrowing is a fundamental part of our world. But with a deepening cost of living crisis, for many, the burden of debt looks only set to increase. Welcome to LSEIQ the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Jess Winterstein from the IQ team, where we work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas. In this episode, I ask, do we always need to pay our debts? I'll be asking Joe Spooner why so many of us are in debt and how government could better address the problem, and speaking to Sarah Williams, founder of advisory website DebtCamel, about how those concerned about their finances might be able to mitigate some of the most damaging aspects of being in debt. Skipping meals, turning off the heating, and 84% of people worried about the next six months. The cost of living in the UK is rising and it's changing people's lives. The nation is in the grip of a cost of living crisis. There's no denying that times are hard in the UK. Before the pandemic, millions of people were considered over-indebted, In 2021, the number of households struggling with large debts increased by a third, a trend that's only likely to have continued into 2022 and beyond. Why, in one of the richest countries in the world, are so many in such a vulnerable position? We haven't seen an awful lot of wage growth over the past 10, 15 years. If you want to go back further, there's been a long time in which we've seen relatively low levels of wage growth. I mean, by some measures, wages are still below the amount that they were before the global financial crisis. I'm speaking to Dr Joseph Spooner, author of Bankruptcy, The Case for Relief in an Economy of Debt. He tells me about some of the factors driving ordinary people's indebtedness. One of the theories that's put forward is that we've seen kind of a growth of a loans for wages phenomenon, this idea that while their wages have not been growing in line with the cost of living, sometimes debt has been kind of filling that gap for a lot of people. And that happens at two levels. That happens at the household level because people tend to borrow to to make ends meet and to afford what we might think are necessary for having a reasonable standard of living, but also at the kind of wider economic level. If people do not have a lot of extra money available to contribute to the economy, to go out and spend money and to, to consume, well, then the economy needs people to borrow money in order to kind of keep things ticking over as well. As Joe explains, debt is necessary to help people get by with their household finances, but it's also essential for the health of the wider economy. If people can't spend, or borrow to spend, then that's a problem. In addition, the UK government's austerity programme, which slashed public services, a hangover from the last financial crisis, may also be playing a role in why families and individuals are going into debt. We've also seen some other trend which maybe have been driving different types of debt problems. So one other explanation of rising debt levels is that there's a bit of a trade-off between debt and welfare or the welfare state and the idea that austerity over the past decade and a half may have actually you know led to reduced incomes for many reduced public service provision for others and may have led to households having to take on additional debt in order to bear those costs. Joe tells me how local authorities are increasingly taking a hardline approach to recovering council tax debt often from some of the most deprived households in the country. So some of my research, for example, looks at the big growth in council tax debt over the past decade, where we've seen this scarcely believable position whereby local authorities send about a million bailiffs per year to houses around the country in order to collect council tax what debt. Do take from here? Well, we don't want to take anything at the moment. You get, you're, you're getting this wrong. We don't want to seize any goods from you, OK? Right. Yes, you we want to get the payments sorted. Often, as my research has shown, in in the parts of the country where we see the highest levels of deprivation and the lowest income. So we're seeing um, growth in these kind of problems where it's actually agents of government who are creating the debt problems through the withdrawal of local authority funding, the increased uh, liability of households for council tax debt. 
Um, so a lot of these dynamics have been taking place, which have been contributing to this kind of precarious situation for a lot of households, high levels of debt. And now this is all going to be exacerbated by, by current developments. Are we at the moment just in the middle of a crisis? We're talking a lot at the moment about rising interest rates. And undoubtedly, this is going to pose very significant challenges, particularly for anyone who has a mortgage. But things haven't exactly been wonderfully rosy over the past decade. We haven't exactly been living in a low interest paradise for most of the population over the past decade. So, yes, mortgage interest rates have been kept lower than they would historically would have been due to the low Bank of England base rates. But if you look at the actual rates of interest charge for personal loans, for credit card debts, for overdrafts, for the other kinds of financial products that a, a lot of households will be using, particularly low-income households, the interest rates didn't fall along with the decline in the Bank of England base rate, and they stayed consistently high um, even after the global financial crisis. It may not always be possible to predict what storms are on the horizon, but one rule of government is to plan for the future. I asked Joe if policymakers shouldn't have foreseen and been better prepared for, if not these specific events, then at least some form of global turbulence. Of course, we couldn't have predicted what would have happened regarding the war in Ukraine or the pandemic, but what we could have been predicting were that crises happen. We can go back to the global financial crisis in the late 2000s, and we might have thought at that point, well, We've learned our lesson, right? We saw the harm that can be caused to the economy and, and to average households based on excessive household debt levels. Now, the, the real tragedy, I think, is that we, we haven't really changed uh, the overall place of household debt in our economy since that time. So many trends in our economy have continued to be dependent on households borrowing a lot of money. So for large portions of our economy, people have been getting by and just about getting by for too long, um, whereby there has been a reliance on debt in order to make ends meet, for example, and to pay for essentials. And that obviously leaves very little breathing space when, when things go wrong. And now, of course, the really serious situation is that we're adding the cost of living crisis and rising interest rates into that mix. So we're adding debt problems upon existing debt problems. And that's why I think things at the moment are looking particularly worrisome. Here's one of my suggestions for a, a, a tip, something that's dirt cheap. If you put some of this behind your radiators, it really works. It makes the whole room nice and warm, and it means that you can turn down your thermostat without it causing you any more discomfort. Just that kind of little thing makes such a difference. Uh, moving the sofa away from the radiator. You don't want to be heating the sofa, you want to be heating the room. People know that when their bills arrive, they can either cut their consumption or they can get higher salary or higher wages, go out there and get that new job. Come to Ashfield, look at our food bank, how it works, and I think, you see, I think you'll see first hand that there's not this massive use for food banks in this country. We've got generation after generation who cannot cook properly, they can't cook a meal from scratch, they cannot budget, the challenge is there. I'm sure I'm not alone in having been given the talk about needing to be responsible with my money as I took my first steps into independence, nor in finding that easier said than done once I had control of the purse strings alongside what seems now like far too easy access to credit. Although the comments we've just heard from former and current Conservative MPs Edwina Curry, Jake Berry and Lee Anderson drew criticism, they are not alone in believing that those struggling with debt could help themselves by making better life choices. Are they right? Could perhaps a course on budgeting be the most effective help government could give? There are certainly people that go through their whole life with you know, never having any debt apart from a mortgage or and a credit card, which is paid off in full. That's lovely for them. <laughs> it doesn't mean that everybody else is, is um, financially incompetent or illiterate or in need of cooking lessons because they're spending too much on takeaways or, or anything like that. That's Sarah Williams, whose experience advising people with debt problems has given her a different view than those perhaps more removed from the realities of a limited budget. As founder of Debt Camel, a website that provides independent and impartial advice on debt management, she's reminded on a daily basis of the numerous reasons people can find themselves in debt, many of which are out of their control. Very often when I'm actually talking to people with real debt problems, 
they are masters at budgeting. They know exactly what money's coming in, how they split it up, how they manage, how they get through, through the month. People set up their lives around what's happening to them. You know, they plan weddings or holidays or enrolling children in ballet classes and things on the assumption that life will go on pretty much as, as it has gone on. At the start of this year, nobody would have budgeted for their energy bills doubling by this point. And now it looks like they're going to carry on going up further. So nobody could have predicted this. Um, um, so you couldn't budget for it sensibly. Against that, we've got a backdrop of a large number of people. The Money and Pension Service normally says about 8 million people in this country that were struggling with their finances before the start of this year. And those people, it's got worse <laughs> because the things which have gone up in price are mostly tend to be the absolute essentials. Um, you can't cut back on well, petrol if you need to get to work. There's a limit to the amount you can reduce your food budget by. And rent and mortgage, they are what they are. They have to be paid. So those people were struggling already and their position has got a lot worse. And then there's the sort of big background of, you know, real wages not keeping up with inflation, which means that more and more people have done negative budgets, the safety net, benefit safety net is in tatters. This is a really complicated picture with people, a whole spectrum of people across the whole country. There's a, an internet meme going around, it's ascribed to Desmond Tutu, I'm not sure if he ever actually did say it, which says that, you know, we're here, we keep fishing these bodies out of the river as they come round the bend in the river. At some point, we have to stop fishing people out of the river and we have to go round the bend and find out why they are falling in in the first place. And I think that's what needs to be concentrated on. And going back to the idea of uh, financial literacy is like saying we should have more swimming lessons in schools. That isn't actually the problem when people are drowning in this river. <laughs> You're listening to LSEIQ. In this episode, we're asking, do we always need to pay our debts? I've been talking to Sarah Williams, who sees many kinds of financial problems through those contacting her debt advice website. We'll return to Sarah shortly, but first here's Joe Spooner, who's recently contributed to the UK government's review of the personal insolvency framework, which sets out the processes for debt relief in England and Wales. Although policymakers do flex support in times of crisis, its recent energy bills support scheme, for example, for many, these packages will simply not be enough. I asked Joe how effective this approach is. I think that's an excellent point that a lot of policy responses have tended to be piecemeal. So we've looked at different types of problem debt at different uh, points in time after different crises. We need to take a more global, holistic perspective. We need to tackle the problem of household debt head on and we need to tackle it in its entirety. And that's why I look at solutions that involve household debt relief and particularly that's why I focus on the tool of bankruptcy. So the idea of bankruptcy is that it is a legal means through which debts are discharged or cancelled routinely. One of the appealing features of bankruptcy is that once you have bankruptcy laws in place, they can act as what we call automatic stabilizers. The idea that rather than having to design new policy responses every time there is a crisis, if we could put in place certain institutions that automatically kick into gear when economic conditions deteriorate, that might be more advantageous. And bankruptcy could in theory operate like that. And I think there's great potential for bankruptcy to, to offer protection to many households struggling with debt problems, but we probably need to make some key changes in order for that to occur. As Joe highlighted at the start of this episode, people will go to huge lengths to avoid declaring themselves bankrupt. But for those who have few other alternatives, could the issue be reframed in a more positive light? In his book on the subject, Joe argues that bankruptcy laws are in fact ideally placed to help those in financial trouble while offering public policy benefits. He explains. We all know that the law generally tells us you have to pay your debts. But since at least the 18th century, we've had this idea that if you are insolvent, if you cannot pay your debts, well, then the law says you do not have to pay your debts. And once you enter into bankruptcy process, 
once you comply with the relevant conditions and safeguards and the protections against you know potential of abuse of the process etc at the end of the process your debts will be cancelled and you legally will not have to pay your debts anymore now the beauty of this is that it tackles all manner of financial problems right it's not confined to one particular category of debt it's not confined to one particular sector the idea of bankruptcy is that it can look at the whole of a person's situation and can provide them with debt relief across the board. And I think there's a great general appeal to this idea because it can look at the entirety of a person's financial situation and it can provide them with what we call a fresh start, a chance to begin again, a chance to leave behind the historic debt and to, to move forward in life. While many might wish for a fresh financial start, when we borrow money, we make a commitment to paying it back. I asked Joe what he would say to those who might believe bankruptcy laws could be taken advantage of and that those struggling with debt should simply have made more responsible financial choices. Whenever bankruptcy policy is raised, there are often are discussions based on ideas of personal responsibility and sometimes framed in terms of this idea of moral hazard, the idea that if we offer people protection against certain forms of risks, well, does that make them less likely to take precautions against that risk occurring? But bankruptcy laws have been specifically designed to deal with these kind of problems, right? So nobody, once someone enters into a bankruptcy process, there are certain conditions which must be observed and if there's any suspicion that some sort of dishonesty or recklessness has occurred well then there are legal tools for actually dealing with that i mean this is a concept that's very familiar in bankruptcy if we go back in time to the 18th century when bankruptcy first introduced the idea of debt discharge or debt cancellation it also introduced the death penalty for fraudulent debtors right so there's always been this idea that um, bankruptcy uh, from the get-go has balanced the benefits with these very harsh penalties for abuse of the process right so i don't think we need to worry about this idea of someone entering into bankruptcy on a willy-nilly basis, really. How scared are people of of the idea, though, Um, because there's a stigma and a shame to be seen as not being able to kind of maybe meet your obligations? Yeah, that's a really important point. And look, I'm 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 realistic about this. I'm talking about the the virtues of bankruptcy, the way it can operate to help people um, and to kind of act as a a release valve to relieve some of the pressures of our kind of debt-based economy, our economy which is dependent on high levels of household debt. But the idea is that we've reached a very sorry place when bankruptcy is the answer, right, both for for an individual and and for a society. So I'm talking about bankruptcy in the context that, you know, to use that awful phrase, we are where we are, right? We are in a society which has become dependent on high levels of household debt. And the reality is there are millions of people in the UK who are struggling every day Um, with household debt problems. So I'm being realistic here. This is not going to be a panacea. We have reached a a difficult position where bankruptcy seems like the way out. Um, And it's it's very much true that there's a lot of uh, stigma associated with bankruptcy and people generally don't like the concept of bankruptcy. It's a scary idea. It's a scary word. Uh, The legal system hasn't done a huge amount to help with that over the years. Historically, bankruptcy has been very punitive. But also, I think uh, a a big part of the problem is just um, a lack of awareness, a lack of knowledge. There are lots of myths about bankruptcy, what it involves, um, and what kind of negative consequences will be associated with bankruptcy. And a part of the work that I do is try to have, you know, honest, rational conversations about what bankruptcy involves to take away some of this mystery, um, which can be problematic. If we can see bankruptcy as being part of the social safety net, as being kind of an an undesirable but essential feature of our contemporary debt-based economy and something that we could maybe normalise in that way that could potentially help. But yeah, we have to be realistic about that. We can't change attitudes overnight. Sarah Williams agrees that societal attitudes make it harder for people to address their financial issues. People always say that we're very bad about talking about money in England. And I think that extends over to debt. Um, in many ways, debt has sort of become normalised. So uh, you go to university, you get an overdraft automatically. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's normal to get a credit card in your late teens, early 20s, probably long before you actually really thought about 
managing your finances and what they're going to look like in five or ten years' time. I think people would are reluctant to say to a friend or somebody they know casually that you know they're having trouble paying their credit card debt because it sounds like you're incompetent. Um, whereas what it actually means is you've fallen into the consumer trap and the person you're talking to may be in exactly the same position, but they're not saying it either. So I think the fact that the problems are so much more widespread and are on the news the whole time, financial problems, um, in, in one way it can only be good in the sense that it should be moving some of the um, mystique about it. But there's still a lot of problems in the way we talk about debt and credit and things like credit ratings. It sounds nice, doesn't it? I mean, you must want to have a good credit rating because it makes you sound like you're a good, good human being. You know, you're good at life. You've got a good credit rating. And people can go to enormous lengths to try to protect their credit rating. But in the end, if you can't pay your current bills and debts, and have the debts going down each month, then they are going to be going up. And freezing the interest, which does harm your credit rating, is is the only way forward for that. And the credit rating only matters if you need to borrow more money. It's a factor. But compared to everything else and that's going on in your life and, you know, your ability to feed the children and, and, and have a warm home, your credit rating is actually not that important. While both reasonable concerns and common misconceptions can be addressed with more openness around issues of personal finance, Sarah's clear that too many of us are still putting off difficult conversations. She reminds me that it's never too early to explore our options and that these may be more than we realise. The earlier somebody gets help with a debt problem, the more solutions there are and the nicer solutions they are. Go and talk to a debt advisor about your options and they may be able to signpost you to extra benefits you could claim or extra things like social broadband, social tariffs for water. You'll probably hear a lot in the next couple of months about a social tariff for energy because that's one of their options going forward from April. There is a significant underclaim of some of the major benefits in this country. The benefit safety net is not good at the moment. It hasn't kept up with um, rising prices and particularly things like rising rents. But there are people who think they can't claim. They don't think it's meant for them. And there's another sort of stigma there, the stigma attached to claiming benefits. It's hard sometimes convincing people to actually take that step. So if you don't think you're eligible for this sort of help, you don't tend to go and look for it. What would you say to someone listening who might be concerned about their finances? If you know you've got problems, you know, you know you're actually struggling to pay the bills, um, it's, you know, you're sort of juggling money around. The first thing you should do is to try and take a snapshot of your situation, list those debts. You might be uncomfortable listing them out. You might be quite surprised what they add up to. And then after another month's juggling, do another list and, and see what's happened. And if your debts have dropped, fine. But if they're going up, there may be a very good reason why they're going that. But if this happens for several months, then you're set on a trend which isn't going to go well. You either need to look at what you can reduce in your budget. You know, there may be subscriptions you can cancel. Check what your partner's getting. See what you can cut out. Sensible moves you can make. Is that going to solve it? If it isn't, the sooner you talk to a debt advisor, the better. And don't put it off. Don't, don't put it off. I see people who seem to have gone from a position for years of saying, well, it's not really bad enough to go and take debt advice. And then when things have got bad, they go, it's so bad, I don't think I no, debt advice won't really be able to help me. So they, <laughs> if you go early and the debt advisor thinks you can manage, then they will give you some useful information. Even if you decide not to proceed, you know what your options are if things get worse in the future. Of course, it's not realistic to think that everyone would seek help at the right time or that those who do will follow the advice given. With an economy built on borrowing and a growing number unable to pay the bills, do we always need to pay our debts? Here's Joe Spooner. It depends how you want to look at this, right? Do you want to look at this from a moral perspective? Do you want to look at this from an economic perspective? There's many different ways we could look at this problem, but I guess 
my main point of view would be that we should all pay our debts up to a point and then a point is reached, whether that's a societal tip of point, whether that's a tipping point for the individual, whether it's a tipping point for our economy, at which point it no longer becomes beneficial to force people to continue to pay their debts, right? So um, I'm happy that I'm in the fortunate position of being able to pay all my debts, and I think it's the right thing for me to continue to do so. But there are certain points at which it no longer becomes socially, economically, morally productive to force people to do so. And what I'm really interested in looking at bankruptcy is how we find that tipping point, right? And where we as a society can agree is the point at which we no longer have an expectation that people should pay their debts in a given set of circumstances. So I guess the answer is that No, we should not always have to pay our debts, but it's a trickier question to find out exactly when we might be satisfied that we will no longer require someone to pay their debts. I asked Sarah Williams the same question. Is debt something we always need to pay? She points out that getting into debt in the first place isn't simply a personal responsibility. I think our society is set up to encourage people to take out debt. And... At some point, it's not actually your fault if you got into a situation where you have too much debt for your current situation to pay it back. So things like freezing the interest can solve some problems. Um, For larger problems, you know, perhaps if you've actually just uh, now got a sick child to look after or, you know, you're getting towards retirement, even if the interest is frozen on your debts, there's no chance of you paying them off within a reasonable time. And almost every society around the world has some form of insolvency option as the option there. It should be seen as a normal way to, when you've got yourself into an impossible situation, either because of you've made mistakes or life events happen to you or some combination of the two of them very often, then you need a clean start. And that's good for you. It's good for your family. It's good for the rest of your life. You know, you're not going to be able to save up for your pension and, and if you're paying back debts constantly. And it's also good for the rest of society it's because if you're, all your money is going towards debt repayments, you're not taking the children out for a meal once a month. You're not going to your local cinema. You're not spending anything in your local shops. Um, So the fact you can't spend any of your money on what's going on in the local economy is actually bad overall for the whole economy, which is why insolvency is a sensible option for a lot of people. and, And it may be one that a lot of people need to consider over the next few years. This episode was produced by me, Jess Winterstein, with editing by Mayan Arad and Oliver Johnson. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, please head to the show notes. And if you enjoy LSEIQ, please leave us a review. Catch us next time when we ask, how can we solve the refugee crisis?